We've had some good news on the vaccine and medical science looks like it could ultimately save us from this pandemic. That's a good thing because our political class certainly can't. From late lockdowns to fudged testing stats, our government's response to COVID has been an outright failure. But for some, it's work worked out just fine. For who you ask? Of course, their friends. Their friends have done pretty good um, out of the last six catastrophic months um, when it comes to government policy. So there was a great investigation in the Sunday Times this weekend, which found that the government had awarded £1.5 billion of taxpayer money to companies li linked to the Conservative Party during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, of these firms, none were prominent government suppliers before this year. So £1.5 billion to their mates and their mates who worked in industries which aren't really related to what they were being contracted to do. Looks quite suspicious to begin with. And when we go into the details, it remains very suspicious, only more suspicious. Um, so I'm not expecting procurement processes between government and private firms to be, you know, something that you have that much familiarity with, to be honest, before this pandemic, neither did I. Um, but a couple of fundamentals which are important to remember as we go through this story, which is that when a contract is given to a private provider, there are sort of two fundamental conditions that are normally met um, from the government. So one is they must be advertised. Um, so, you know, the, the, the process by which that contract is going to be, give, be given out has to be transparent and you have to have an opportunity to apply for it if you don't happen to be friends with someone in the government. And there is also a legal requirement of the government to publish details of awarded contracts within 30 days. Now, during the pandemic, neither of these things has happened. This is all background. We're going to tell you the specifics in a moment. Um, ministers have used emergency procedures to award work directly. Um, and again, many of these went to their mates. So the Sunday Times, um, which is the article we're using for much of this section, worth reading, um, they try to be sympathetic to the government on breaking the rules I've just explained to you. So they write, this is a world in which ministers have turned to friends with links to the Conservatives because of a mixture of trust, convenience, and a panicked need to deliver rather than a desire to benefit themselves financially. The end result, however, is arguably similar. Friends of the Conservatives have played a central role in responding to the pandemic, securing high-profile positions and contracts along the way. This pattern of conduct became visible in May with Britain in lockdown when Boris Johnson and the Health Secretary Matt Hancock turned to trusted contacts to run parts of the pandemic response. This was all done in a panic. It was done in a difficult situation. You can see why you wouldn't go through the proper normal channels when you've got doctors and nurses, you know, saying, look, we can't do our jobs because we don't have proper PPE. You, you can imagine, you don't say, oh, well, you've got 40, 30 days to apply to become a provider of PPE. You can see why they just say, you know, we need to sign this contract with you this evening so that we can get it as soon as possible. That all makes sense. The problem is when you go into the details of what's happening, um, it has very little to do, it seems, with people just, you know, working through a difficult situation in the best possible way. Often, you know, people are just behaving in a fairly appalling fashion. And we're going to introduce you to some of the worst cases now. Um, so I'm hoping we can get up George Pascoe Watson. So he's one of the big characters in all of this. Um, so he is chairman of Portland Communications, which is a lobbying firm that represents pharmaceutical companies such as Pfizer and weapons manufacturers and banks such as Barclays and HSBC. Um, it also has a number of Tory advisors on its board. Um, he was also the former political editor of The Sun newspaper. You can get an impression of the politics of this guy. Now, during the pandemic, Pasco Watson was appointed by the Department of Health and Social Care as an advisor, though this wasn't announced. Now, you could say, there's no excuse for that not to be announced. Being in a rush or being in a high-stress situation doesn't mean you shouldn't tell, you know, uh, tell public authorities who you've employed. Anyway, um, let's go to what's written up about this guy's role. Pasco Watson participated in daily strategic discussions chaired by Lord Bethel, a hereditary peer and former lobbyist who serves as test and trace minister for six months. Bethel 53 was a surprise appointment in March, having chaired Matt Hancock's leadership campaign in 2019 and giving a £5,000 donation. Hancock, the health secretary and Baroness Harding, the head of Test and Trace, are understood to have joined calls including Pasco Watson and senior officials about how to communicate announcements and policy. So you've got this guy who is a former political editor at The Sun and works at a PR agency where lots of Tories sit on the board. And now with no announcement, there's no public um, admission of this, he's sitting in on, on phone calls with some of the most important people um, in the, the government response to this pandemic. Um, Lord Bethel, who serves as the Test and Trace Minister, and then Dido Harding and Matt Hancock, who I'm sure you, you know about. 
it gets worse because not only is this person in government meetings and it's a secret, it's kind of suspicious, um, but this guy who is um, a boss, basically, um, at Portland Communications, was releasing private information he was getting in these meetings to people, to clients of Portland Communications. So he works for a, a communications company where you're a, you're a corporate client, you go to him to sort out your communications. He's emailing you inside information about government policy when it comes to coronavirus before the public or media know about it. Now, some examples. You, like me, probably only found out about the current lockdown late on the night of the 30th of October when it leaked to the press um, or in Johnson's press conference on the 31st of October. You remember, it was Halloween, and that was when we found out we couldn't leave the house for a month. Um, but if you were a client of Portland Communications, um, you would have found out two days earlier. So this is incredibly important public information, which is going to people who pay um, a, a, an advertising agency, essentially, a communications agency, to get that information. It's going out to them before it goes out to the public, before it goes out to people in the NHS. Um, they also got some information we still haven't been told. Um, so there is an email which was about tier two restrictions in London. This was on the 15th of October. And the official position is that it would be reviewed fortnightly. So when Matt Hancock announced this restriction system, he said, we'll be reviewing every two weeks whether or not London in this case should stay in tier two. This guy, Pasco Watson, emails his clients and says, the decision makers have told me personally that spring is likely to be the first opportunity to lift the restrictions. So we've got here someone who is accessing those meetings it's not publicly advertised that they're accessing those meetings. They are someone who sort of moves in Tory circles. And now they're using the information from those meetings to tell their private clients stuff that we don't know as members of the public, stuff that you know, leaders in the NHS don't know. But you can find out if you are a client of one of, you know, someone who moves in Tory circles. All oh, it's, it's nasty. Um, we're going to go through some more figures in the chumocracy. And I'm going to go to you, Ash, for for your comments on all of this. But these are some of the big names. So we're going to go to Dido Harding. She is a former tele telecoms boss and wife of a conservative MP. She was appointed to run Test and Trace, and which was announced in a tweet by Health Secretary Matt Hancock. She was also given a peerage by Cameron. Um, she also goes horse riding with, with Matt Hancock. So married to an MP, friends with Matt Hancock. She's not really from a public health background, and she gets appointed without any sort of advertising process to lead Test and Trace. Around the same time that she's appointed, Kate Bingham is appointed to another leading job. She's appointed to run the vaccine task force. Incredibly important job, just like um, leading NHS Test and Trace. Now, just like Dido Harding, she is also married to a Tory MP. Not only that, she is a family friend of Boris Johnson. And um, Boris Johnson, when he decided um, she should have the job, he gave her a personal call asking her to come on board. So again, this wasn't advertised. He was just like, oh, I'll get my, I'll get my friend Kate Bingham to do it. Um, he calls her, asks her to do it. Um, her response is funny. Um, so this is from the Sunday Times. According to a speech that Bingham 55 gave to a group of US venture capitalists, another theme there, she responded to Johnson's offer by saying, I'm not a vaccine expert. Why should I be the right person? <laughs> she obviously got the job. I say it's relevant that she was speaking to US venture capitalists there because just like Pasco Watson, she has also been pretty goddamn irresponsible with the position of authority she has found herself in. So she has also been giving out sensitive information to people who have paid for the privilege. Um, so in her case, she shared information to investors about the vaccines the government were interested in. Incredibly important information if you're an investor. Which companies are the, are the government interested in investing in? She gave out all of this information to people who'd paid £200 a head or $200 a head um, to take part in a particular conference. So you've got more people profiting from you know, public information from the public vaccine response. We've got two more to go through. Um, Lord Feldman. So he is a former chairman of the Conservative Party. Uh, he runs a lobbying firm. He used to play tennis um, with David Cameron. He was quietly appointed as an unpaid advisor. Again, lots of people are unpaid advisor, which I think is part of the moral. I think they think, well, I'm not paid for it. I might as well make a profit from it on the side. Um, he was appointed as an unpaid advisor to Lord Bethel. Um, that was never formally announced. And now we need to introduce you to Lord Bethel. Who's Lord Bethel? Um, so he is a hereditary peer and nightclub baron turned health minister. Um, as we've already mentioned, he gave money and chaired the health secretary, Matt Hancock's 2019 Tory leadership campaign. So it was a surprise when he got appointed by Matt Hancock because he didn't have much experience to take on the role of minister for test and trace. 
But the connection he did have to Matt Hancock is that he'd given five grand to his leadership campaign. I find it astonishing how cheap it is to buy influence with these people. Um, not that I've got a spare five grand, but you know what I mean. To, to, to be at the, the top of government, it seems surprising. That's all it takes. Um, Lord Fellman is an ex-Tory chair. He was appointed to assist this guy, a Tory peer and donor to Matt Hancock, to work with industry during the pandemic. And we've got one more because Feldman sat in on a phone conversation between Bethel and Tory donor David Meller. And this is the real icing on the cake. So you've got a, a, a meeting between Feldman, Bethel and David Meller. You've got a Tory, ex-Tory chairman, Tory donor. And now this guy who's again a Tory donor and his firm, Meller Design, um, a design firm, has been awarded £163 million of PPE contracts. And the connection here is that most of those donations from Meller came when Feldman was party chair. Um, party chair is responsible for fundraising. So you've got this, this connection of people who are all very you know, intertwined with the history of the Conservative Party. Lots of them donors to the Conservative Party. And suddenly you've got all of them in these Zoom calls responsible for spending millions and billions of, of pounds, um, giving out sort of privileged, sensitive information left, right and centre to their clients. And the whole thing just just stinks. The thing worth focusing on is the fact that £1.5 billion has been spent by, by the government to people they have personal connections with who don't have any experience providing the things they've been paid to provide. In any other country, you'd call this corruption. And I think that's just the first thing we need to say. Any other country, you would call this corruption. And yet the media in this country is so... It's like a beaten dog, which has internalized the violent logic of its owner. It's so scared of losing access that they're refusing to call things for what they are. So you get these stories which end up being nowhere near as big as they ought to be. This is the kind of thing which should, you know, lead to resignations, sackings, an inquiry and, you know, the, the hounding of some of these key figures out of public life. But the media consistently, you know, pulls its punches with regards to these kinds of stories. There's a sense of, well, there must have just been kind of mistake. I don't think she could have meant to pay herself these outrageous sums of money, or I don't think he could have meant to have, uh, you know, given a contract worth millions to his old, you know, drinking buddy. Um, and I think that that's a problem. I think that that's one of the reasons why these stories don't have the kind of cut through uh, that they ought to. And, you know, the story of, of corruption and sleaze, it's an old one. Um, but I think that we've got a, a media climate which is least equipped to handle it. The other thing um, to note is that relatively early on in the pandemic, you know, I'm talking about late April and May, stories were emerging of billions of pounds worth of state contracts being given out without a proper tender process. And so what that means is that normally when you have a state contract being put out, there's got to be some element of competition. So companies put in different kinds uh, of bids saying how much they'll do for how much money in the state supposedly is able to get the best deal through that. Coronavirus became a pretext and an opportunity to just let the piggies directly at the trough, right? So you've got this huge transfer of wealth from public to private hands, which has also resulted in the parcelization of our healthcare infrastructure, most notably with test and trace. Um, you've got incredible sums of money being handed out to companies which have absolutely no expertise or um, background in providing healthcare support or manufacturing PPE or whatever it is. Do you remember how much we all laughed with uh, when Chris Grayling handed out a contract to a company which didn't actually have any ferries, 14 million pound contract. Do you remember yes. how ridiculous that sounded? Mm. Well, now it's now, billions now of pounds thing... everywhere for people who have nothing to do with the thing they've been paid to produce. And I think that the problem is, is that unless there's a real reckoning, and I, I've got an idea of how that reckoning should go. Um, go on, lay it out. Is that your three point know. plan? How does the a reckoning go? Plan. Basically, I think that this should be a moment like phone hacking. 
right, in a way that it led to Leveson. Phone hacking was this kind of, you know, in some way it was what Paul Mason always dreamed of, was a sort of strategic alliance between the left and the centre. And it did have some consequences, if not all the kinds of consequences that we wanted. And I think that anti-corruption campaigning could actually be a really strong place for the left and for liberals to find some shared terrain, shared campaigning objectives. The reason why I don't hold my breath that that's going to happen is that right now the centre is still too convinced with, you know, sealing Corbynism in a tomb and then burying that tomb at the bottom of the deepest trench of the Atlantic Ocean. And I think with that set of priorities, you're not going to necessarily see the kind of work being done uh, around these issues that that you need because the media is not going to do it. They're not going to do it. And so I think that means that you are going to have to have some kind of grassroots campaigning effort um, towards making it a big story. And I just don't think... uh, I don't think anyone's in the place to make that happen, unfortunately. Mm. I mean, we should say, I mean, I, I totally agree that, I mean, if you look at the broadcast media commentary on this, I don't think Matt Hancock got asked any questions about this at the daily briefing. Um, but I mean, obviously, we're taking this story, or we're, we're getting a lot of the detail from this story from the Sunday Times, who, I mean, politically aren't aligned with us. But one thing they do have is quite well-funded journalists, which means they can put some time into investigations, especially the Sunday Times. I think that the normal Times doesn't bother quite so much, which leads me to saying, um, that if you want us to do the same kind of investigations that these big multi-billion companies can do, um, that's precisely why we really want you um, to go to support support.navaramedia.com, donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month so we can start doing these investigations as well. Mm-hmm.